Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldein. In lecture 33, uh, at the end of it, we prove the so-called first isomorphism theorem for groups. In lecture 34, I want to prove the second and third isomorphism theorems, uh, for which before we can prove them, there's a there's sort of a lemma that we need to prove, which honestly, this, this result is fairly interesting in its own right. So we'll actually call it a proposition, you know, upgrade it a little bit. Uh, and this has to do with when is the product of subgroups actually a subgroup? So let's say that G is a group, uh, finite or infinite, doesn't matter. We have a subgroup H and a normal subgroup N. So both H and N are subgroups. They'll be closed under multiplication, identity, and inverses. But N will also be closed under conjugation since it's a normal subgroup. So with these assumptions in hand, if we take the product, that is the Frobenius product of N times H times N, we mean that we're going to take every possible product of something from H and something from N that gives you a set. Then under these circumstances where H is a subgroup and N is a normal subgroup, the product H times N is a subgroup of G. And in fact, if N, uh, excuse me, if H is a normal subgroup of G, then the product HN is in fact also a normal subgroup of G. So if you take a product of two subgroups and one of them is normal, then the product will be a subgroup. And if they're both normal, then the product will be a normal subgroup. Now I should mention that these are sufficient conditions to guarantee when the product of two uh, subgroups of a group will be a subgroup or a normal subgroup. This is not a necessary condition. There are conditions for which you can take a product of a non-normal subgroup with a non-normal subgroup, and that is uh, the product could be a subgroup or even a normal subgroup, in fact. So we won't explore every possibility, but let's prove this very important result right here. So we're going to first show that we're only going to assume H is a subgroup for a moment and that N is a normal subgroup. Let's prove that H times N is a subgroup. So it's got to be closed under the identity, closed under multiplication, closed under inverses. We'll proceed in that manner. So let's first show that HN has the identity. This is pretty easy. Since H is a subgroup, it'll contain the identity. Let's call it E, the identity of G. Likewise, since N is a subgroup, it'll also contain E. And so because E is in both H and N, E times E will be an HN, but as this is the identity, it's actually idempotent, and this is just equal to E. So HN contains the identity element E, first, first thing checked. Now let's show that it's closed under multiplication. Suppose we have two elements, we'll call them X and Y, which live inside the set HN. We want to show that X times Y is contained inside of HN. Well, since X belongs to HN, that means there's some element little h inside of H, and some little n inside of capital N so that x equals hn. And likewise, since y is inside of hn, there's some h prime in h and some n prime in n so that y equals h prime n prime. Being inside the set hn uh, guarantees these factorizations of the elements x and y. All right, and so this is why this is why it's going to be important that we're normal. So remember, if you're a normal subgroup, that means all of your left cosets are actually equal to their corresponding right cosets. So for example, the coset H prime N is equal to N H prime. What this means for us is that whenever you have an element of N and you multiply it by the element H prime, you can commute H prime past the N, although you might switch to a different N inside of the set. So in particular, if you take, this, if you take uh, the product N times H prime, H prime can commute with N prime, but there's with N, but there's a price. You're going to switch from little n to a different element of the subgroup capital N. Let's call that element N double prime. So N double prime is inside of N right there. So we can move N, we can move H prime past N by switching it to some other element of the subgroup N. That's that's what's guaranteed by normality because left and right cosets are the same thing. All right, so now let's look at closure here under multiplication. If we take the product x times y, well, x has the factorization hn, y has the factorization h prime, n prime, which, as we're in a group, I can just reassociate these things. So let's put the parentheses around the n and the h prime just to focus on that for a moment. Well, the normality of the subgroup n, like we said earlier, says that n h prime is equal to h prime n double prime for some potentially different element of n. So n h prime becomes h prime n double prime. Redoing the parentheses again, you get an h times h prime, and n double prime times n prime. Well, as h is a subgroup, 
If you take the product of two things in H, that'll be inside of H. So H times H prime is inside of H. Uh, likewise, N is a subgroup. Uh, so if I take the product of two things in N, N double prime and N prime, you'll get something in N. So this get, looks like, oh, this belongs to H, this belongs to N, so their product belongs to HN, right there. So therefore, we see that HN is closed under multiplication. The last thing to show that it's a subgroup, we need to show inverses. Again, since N is a normal subgroup, the left coset H inverse N is equal to the right coset H, uh, excuse me, N H inverse. So again, what does it mean for these two cosets to be the same? It means that if I take the element N double prime, excuse me, N inverse, which belongs to N, and you multiply that by H inverse, I can bring H inverse to the other side. I can commute it with H with N inverse, but I'm going to switch to a different element of N. Let's call that element N triple prime. So we get this factorization, or more of a commutation, I should say, N inverse H inverse will equal H inverse N triple prime, where N triple prime could be N prime or N inverse all we know, but it's just some element of N, potentially different, very likely different. And so then when you look at X inverse, well, X, remember, is HN. Uh, if we take HN inverse by the shoe sock principle, we switch the order of these things. You put your shoes on, then, or well, I should say, you put your socks on, then your shoes, then you take your shoes off, then you take off your socks. So it switches things around when you take the inverses. So you have N inverse, H inverse. We want it to be an H element and then an N element. So it's kind of backwards. This is where this commutation principle comes into play. N inverse H inverse is equal to H inverse N triple prime. Well, H inverse is inside of H because H is a subgroup and N triple prime is inside of N. So this belongs to H N and therefore H N is cl closed under inverses. This then shows that H N is a subgroup of G. So, uh, and so, what, so far we've done, we assumed that H was a subgroup and we assumed that N was a normal subgroup. We got that H times N was a subgroup. Now, let's suppose that H is a normal sub, subgroup of G. We will continue to believe that N is a normal subgroup of G. Let's now show that H times N is closed under conjugation, thus showing that it's a, it's a normal subgroup. So if we take an arbitrary element G inside of the group G, and let's take our element x here, which again, x is an arbitrary element of h times n. So let's look at the conjugate of x by this by g here. Well, since x belongs to hn, it can be factored as some little h times some little n, which we can then insert uh, between h and n some identity element e, for which that identity element is going to be g inverse g that we can see right here. Uh, then redoing parentheses, of course, we then get g h g inverse and then G and G inverse. The significance of this, of course, is that when you look at the uh, this element G, H, G inverse, this is a conjugate of H. As H belongs to H, little h belongs to big H, its conjugate will belong to H because it's normal. Same thing here. We're looking at a conjugate of little n. Little n belongs to big N, so therefore its conjugates will belong to big N. We have something from H times something from N that gives you something in HN. So therefore, uh, it's inside of the set. And this shows us that HN is closed under conjugation, for which that then shows us that HN is a normal subgroup of G.